So now we're going to talk about ag directly. Uh, the t a headline here from an article in The Atlantic, Agriculture Needs More Women. So we're going to address that. Uh, the moderator for this next panel is Amy Wu, who's a longtime journalist from this area. She's working for USA Today. She recently moved out of the area to New York. Uh, got her timing just right. She moved there in the fall so she could get the full experience of a New York winter. And now she's saying, I think I'm coming back to California. So hopefully she'll be back soon. But she is here today for our panel. Come on up, Amy, and the panel. If you want to come up and take your seats. And I will turn it over to Amy to introduce our next panel. Okay. So I'm honored to be here and moderate the Women in Agriculture panel today, and thank everybody for coming out, uh, coming out today afternoon. So according to the USDA, um, agriculture is one of the most male, continues to be one of the most male-dominated industries within various sectors. In 2012, the census said the number of women farmers in the U.S. was uh, 969,672 or 30% of farmers. This was actually a 2% decline in women farmers since 2007 when the last census was conducted. Um, in in uh, 2019, the next uh, census is coming out, so we'll be interested to see what trends are there. But at the same time, agriculture as an industry faces um, tremendous challenges, especially with a continued labor shortage, an aging workforce, and having to feed the world's population of 9 billion by uh, 2050. So um, we're going to explore what are some of the opportunities within these challenges. And I'm very excited to introduce um, three women leaders in agriculture who are going to share their own uh, stories of challenges and opportunities. Um, to my immediate left is Margaret Diarigo Martin. I'm going to share a little bit about her and her bio. She is the Vice President of Community Development for Taylor Farms. She has over 35 years of experience in the produce uh, business, uh, including uh, Executive Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Diarigo Brothers uh, Company of California. And in the middle um, is Lori Coster. Lori uh, is the former chairman, CEO, and primary shareholder of Man Packing Company, uh, a grower, shipper, processor of fresh vegetables headquartered in uh, California's Salinas Valley. I'm, I'm a big fan of, of, their, of their produce and always uh, buy their packaged meals. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, and under her leadership, Man Packing was certified actually as a women's business enterprise through the Women's Business Enterprise National Council, the nation's um, largest third party certifier of business owned and operated by women in the U.S. And then we have uh, Angela Nunez. Um, Angela is the Vice President of Technical Support at Smartwash Solutions, a subsidiary of Taylor Farms, which focuses on food safety. She has a bachelor's uh, degree in agriculture and food science from the University of British Columbia, a master's degree in food science from UBC also, and an MBA from uh, IESC Business School at the University of Navarra. So I think I read enough acronyms here, and I think we're going to take a, <laughs> a jump into the uh, questions. So um, really excited to have uh, these three amazing women. Um, so I'm going to take a, a, a jump right into uh, the questions here and start with a bit of their stories. Um, and we're going to go down the row over here and would love to have us um, have you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into agriculture, specifically in the Salinas Valley, and just tell us a bit about your story. So we'll start with Margaret over here. Thank you. Is that on? You can hear me okay? Um, okay, so um, I am a third generation from a family farming operation. I'm not a farmer, but a farmer's daughter, which I think is equally as important. Um, youngest of six kids, and um, ironically, in an Italian family, usually it's the oldest male that goes into the company business and, and runs it, but in our case, it was the youngest male and the youngest female. So I think that's kind of unique. Um, so I, I graduated from UC Davis with a degree in agriculture and pretty much knew I was going to um, go back to the family farm, but... I took a detour so I could work for some other companies so I could gain some outside experience. I didn't want to come back with just my degree and ask my dad for a job. I wanted to be able to 
you know, interview on my own and, and earn my own credentials. And so I did that for several years and then I came back to the family business and worked up through the ranks, pretty much doing everything um, that farmers do um, over my 22 years and ended up as um, the executive vice president of sales and marketing, which is where I found my passion. Um, and I think I was the be best at that because I really liked working with the customers. I liked understanding what their needs were. I liked that human contact. And I think that women in, in a sales role can be very powerful and very effective because they build relationships very easily and they nurture those relationships. So that's where I found my strength. And at Taylor Farms, I've been working more on the community side, but um, still very involved in, in the family business and in agriculture. And I'm here because I just think it's really exciting that women are pursuing a career in ag. There's tremendous opportunities. We're really good at what we do, and so I'm happy to see a lot of women in the audience listening today. So thank you. Okay, my name is Lori, and similar to Margaret, we do a lot of these panels together. Yes. <laughs> uh, third generation, you know, born and raised here in the Salinas Valley, and um, just grew up in the family business. I remember in eighth grade, out in our garage, we used to send out posters to schools all over the U.S., and my dad would bring the orders home, and I'd have my little AM, FM radio set up, and... It's funny, we still send those posters out today. So just always worked part-time growing up in various areas. I'm a um, product of the CSU system, Chico State. Whoop, whoop. Um, so marketing and public relations is my background. After college, I went back full-time and did all the trade communication and marketing, um, product development efforts. But I left in 1999. Um, I had two little boys at home, and I um, formed a consulting company. And I consulted for the business. and then. Tragically, you know, I had an older brother and a dad that were running the business, and they both passed away within 14 months of each other, very unexpectedly. So I came back in 2006 and took over the family business, and I'm proud to say, you know, we had our women-owned era, but just this past Monday, we closed a transaction with Del Monte Fresh Produce Company, and we sold the business for $360 million. So um, not the end of an era, but onward and upward. So happy to be here today. Hello, my name is Angela Nunez. I am originally from Chile, so you're going to have to forgive my accent and a few words here that don't make much sense. But I come from uh, Canada, actually, as well. So I started studying agriculture out of necessity, so to speak. Uh, when I, I got accepted at UBC, I told my dad, oh, I want to be uh, marine biologist or a doctor and I he told me very pragmatic study something you can earn a living no matter where you are and uh, in what condition you are as a family of immigrants uh, we realized that you may be a doctor somewhere else but if you move around you may not you may be a janitor in another country and it's a very tough life so uh, being pragmatic and not knowing English very well, I thought, I'll go to something that I can do. And uh, that was uh, agriculture, food science. I ended up in the United States in California uh, because my life made a rather bad turn at that time. So I got divorced, I didn't have working papers, not a driver license. And I thought, I'm not going back. I'm going to stay here and make it work, even though it may be hard, it may be painful, it may be take me a while. But it turned out uh, better than I expected. So sometimes bad things turn out to be quite good. So Lynn, thank you very much for sharing a bit of your stories. Um, I'm curious uh, your, on what you think currently are some of the most um, critical challenges and needs in, um, the, in agriculture now, and what is needed, in your opinion, to solve them, including what skills do you think are needed? And we'll start with Margaret. Okay. Um, well, I think some of them were mentioned earlier, and, and you probably hear a lot of it through the news. Um, labor, obviously, is a huge issue. Um, labor to harvest our crops, primarily. Um, and then also water, water challenges that we all face. Um, but I think because the um, industry is evolving so quickly, that also creates a lot of opportunities. Most of you have heard about um, the opportunities in STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math. Those are definitely skill sets that our industry is looking for, and we're grooming um, students that um, come out of college to have that, that skill set. Soft skills are really important. Being able to interview and be able to communicate your, um, your thoughts. Someone said speaking up. Um, having an opinion is really important. 
And I think as women, sometimes those conversations are difficult to have, but just have confidence in yourself because those conversations are really important. And I think that's what employers are looking for, is someone that knows what they want. Um, and I think one of the challenges is that we don't have enough women. And that's why we're out here recruiting because it's a great industry and the opportunities are tremendous. And women have a lot of the skill sets that are necessary. And I mentioned relationship building. I think that's one of the most important ones. So I encourage um, you to take leadership um, opportunities whenever you have to take leadership courses. That's one thing that I did that helped me um, grow confidence in myself, be able to walk into a room, work a room, build relationships, network. Those are important skill sets that I think women should have. Yeah, I echo the soft skills. Get your face out of your phone. Look up somebody in the eye. Firm handshake, you know, just that old school stuff. I'm a 20 and an 18 year old, so <sighs> welcome to my world. Um, but, you know, I want to echo labor and just to put some, you know, fun facts behind it. Sugar snap peas are our number one commodity. They have to be hand picked. And one sugar snap pea crew, we need 630 people to pick a crop. So we're not talking, you know, five or 10 people. We need an abundant workforce. So um, I'm a big proponent, and I know Margaret is um, about access. You know, it, it's hard for us when we live in this beautiful area to realize that a lot of people don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. A lot of school children don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. And food deserts just aren't in, in rural America, but they're also in downtown Detroit when AMPM is your grocery store. So I think there's a huge advocacy role that people could come into this industry and really help us get better access to fresh fruits and vegetables to all Americans. But remember, this is a very dynamic supply chain. You know, our, our products have a 16-day shelf life. You know, and I sit next to people on the airplane and they marvel from, from field to fork. You know, what we have to do, harvest this in Salinas and get it to a family's table in Maine within 16 days. So, you know, don't think of that tractor mentality of agriculture, and we're all out there with the plow and the pitchfork. It's a very dynamic, very dynamic industry, and particularly now in terms of supply chain and traceability technologies and, and food sciences. I can't think of one discipline that doesn't touch agriculture that you would study in school. So, you know, think, think beyond that stereotype of, of ag, because it's very dynamic. I agree with everything that has been said. Uh, from my perspective, coming from the food safety and technical side, the challenges that I see is that things are changing very rapidly and very dramatically. Uh, now we're talking about robotics in the fields and in the plants. We are looking at information technology. We are looking at being able not only to gather data, but analyze it and have intelligence coming out of it. And the people that need to do this are the plants, are the fields, and our personnel, our employees need to be developed. And new people have to come in, people that think outside the box. We no longer can do the things that we did before. The things are changing. So in order to be able to be here five years and 10 years from now, the the companies that are out there need to start developing those skills right now. And that is a challenge. When I put out uh, a job posting, people don't, that come by have, and I'm going to be honest, mediocre mathematical skills, mediocre statistics. They don't know how to use a proper Excel sheet. They don't know how to solve problems. And in our industry, from our, my perspective, need to be able to solve problems quickly and be successful at it and keep developing. If that is not done at the school level to teach how to think that way, how to be proactive, uh, we are not going to be able to move fast enough. Those that do will be successful. Uh, those that don't will fall behind. Okay, excellent. Um, I'd like all of you to talk a little bit about your recruiting process. Um, maybe some, there's some young people and students out there who are curious about this as well. And, and does diversity inclusion play, play a role in that as well? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned inclusion because I, I think it's really important. Um, as far as Taylor Farms is concerned, we have a, an internship program that, we, um, that people, students can apply to online. And I think it's a great way to um, learn about different opportunities within um, our organization and other organizations as well, like what is agriculture, what type of jobs are out there, 
Um, so I, I always encourage students to apply for those internships. They're great. And a lot of interns that get um, hired end up working for the company down the line. So I always encourage that. Um, I think, you know, just being hungry for information and wanting to learn and continuing to learn is really an important thing for all of us to remember. No matter how old you are, you, you're always going to keep learning. Um, right now, I'm finishing my MBA at CSUMB online. I'm in the executive MBA program, so yay! I'll be done in three weeks. I'm counting down. But, you know, again, I mean, here I am at, at my age going back to, to learn more about, like you said, critical thinking skills, um, how to communicate better, um, just learning what's going on in the world and how to apply it back to my industry and, and to uh, my world. So um, I think da data analytics are really important. Um, that's a skill set that not a lot of people enjoy. I'm certainly not a data miner. I don't think that's a lot of fun, but it's an important role that we have to play. Um, I also think you know mentorship is a, is a huge part of something that I'm really passionate about going forward is finding a mentor in the industry if it's something that you're interested in. Um, find a woman that's been there and done that. You know, these are great examples of, of mentors and, and really learn from them, ask those questions and, and find out like, you know, where your passion is. So I think that's really important as well. Yeah, I echo the intern opportunity, but apply early. <laughs> I get so frustrated when people call me at the end of May looking for a summer intern. We interview before spring break for our summer intern positions, so get ahead of the ball. And also, we started doing um, job shadowing opportunities because it's less commitment on our part than an internship, so seniors in high school. So if you get turned down for an internship, say, hey, could I come and shadow for a day? And that way, you know, employees are spending an hour with you, not a whole summer. So think outside of the box if you don't get that internship opportunity. And, you know, data is the future. What can I say? If you don't know how to use Excel, learn how to use Excel. <laughs> um, Power BI tools, um, you know, now we've got UPC codes on all of our products, so we know when they sell, how they sell, how fast they sell, how well they sell on promotion, how well they don't sell on promotion. So you're going to have to know how to manipulate data and do space to sales analysis and all of that. Um, but again, the soft skills too, don't, don't forget. And you're gonna get those through networking and going to um, different events and whatnot. Uh, it's kind of funny today, this morning, I was told, Angela, you need to diversify. There are not women in your team. And I said, <laughs> it's open to everyone. But if women want to work in our team, it's not a very glamorous job. And the women that have applied haven't taken the challenge. When I tell them you have to be out 50% of the time traveling, you're going to be in a wet environment. Uh, from time to time, you may break one, two, three nails. And, uh, you know, you wear a hairnet. Hairnet, you're not, you're not going to wear makeup. Get photographed. And sometimes people are going to be rude to you. And uh, it's tough. And you're going to be aching here and there. Uh, they don't apply. So if you want to go into certain fields, and you want to have a position that is a director or VP, you got to go through that. You need to learn uh, how things work. And you need to take those challenges. It's not as hard as people think it is. If I can uh, do some electrical work, and if I can do some you know, technical stuff, I wasn't an electrician. I wasn't a mechanic. But we're intelligent enough to figure things out, to see how things work. So when there is a position and it says, uh, you know, you have to have mechanical skills or this or that, don't think, I will not think that a woman that doesn't have those particular skills cannot do the job. We train, we are looking for diversity. We're looking for a different perspective on solved problems. And that sometimes takes a, wo a woman's view. We're also looking for people with multiple skills. Uh, you'd be surprised that sometimes we need people that are bilingual. Surprise. Sometimes we need people that speak not just Spanish or English. I was just recently in Europe, and there are opportunities not just in California, but in other parts of the world. And knowing French at that point mattered. Nobody knew French. So, so on the same lines, I'm uh, curious, so if I'm a young woman, a student interested in the industry, and you've addressed some of this, but where, where can I go to get a mentor and to network? What, do, what are your recommendations? Well, um, I'll put a plug in for Empower, which is an organization that I started 10 years ago, and it's basically, <laughs> I, I have to do this. Um, it's you know, bringing women together to support one another. 
Um, and we have our lunches three times a year. You can look at us up on the website. Um, we're starting a new 501c3. Um, but that's a great opportunity to come and meet women that are in the industry or women that are just professionals or philanthropists or stay-at-home moms. It doesn't matter. But anyways, you know, I, I would imagine that um, all of you have somebody that you know in the industry that you can um, make a connection with. And those connections are really important. Um, you tend to get hired based on who you know. Let's, let's face it, that's kind of how the world works. And internships are the same way. So um, get out there and network as much as you can. Meet people. Make yourself available. Um, I think those are the, the key things. You know, uh, there's a Welly um, Institute at Hartnell that's Women's Educational Leadership Institute. I would hope that maybe CSUMB might start something like that for women in the future. So a leadership program where women can come together, learn from each other, and empower one another. I think that's the best advice that I would have to give. I would echo all of that, but also take advantage of, you know, Monterey during the summer, there's national, international produce events. So there's the Organic Produce Summit in July, and the Produce Marketing Association has a food service conference at the end of July. Work the lobbies. You know, just walk around, you know, between the Portola Plaza Hotel and the Marriott Hotel downtown, the new conference center. Call these organizations. I will work for free. I will take out the trash. You know, and just expose yourself to these trade shows because they happen right here in our own backyard. I'm really bad for that. Um, I wish I had a mentor when I, I started, to be honest. Um, everything that they have said, do it. But also, you can be a mentor too, okay? Women need support. They need support from other women that are co-workers. They need support from, you know, friends. And I think when sometimes we have obstacles, uh, sometimes those, those people need to be there. So I think as women in the industry, uh, supporting each other at the workplace, supporting each other as, a comp as company members is very, very important. Um, like I said, I wish I had a mentor. I'm probably not the best mentor myself because I'm never there. So, <laughs> <laughs> but if you can, do it. It is worth uh, a lot. Especially, and it doesn't have to be a woman either. Uh, sometimes you can find a mentor that is a man, that is experienced, that has a lot of knowledge. And what I found, to be honest, is sometimes people at the end of their career, they have a lot of knowledge, and they haven't thought about mentoring others because they were very busy. So sometimes those people are the best people to start asking questions, to start learning from their experience, and, of the vast amount of knowledge that they have. Okay, excellent. So um, I've uh, often read and, and heard that the agriculture industry traditionally has been one that's um, uh, passed down from generation to generation, um, from great grandfathers to grandfathers and, and, and so forth. So um, I guess my, what I'm wondering is that, you know, in terms of leadership, whether it be agriculture companies or farms, what do you think it would take to get more women uh, now and going forward into leadership roles, actually running the farm or the operation? Um, I, and do you see things changing? I think it is changing. I think it's evolving very slowly. And agriculture is that type of, um, that type of industry that doesn't move as quickly as others. Um, I think women just have to put themselves up to the challenge and ask for those opportunities. Like I said, those are kind of hard conversations to have. I mean, we were fortunate to be um, part of a family-owned business, but family businesses are very challenging too. Getting along with family, I know for a fact, is very challenging. That's why I'm no longer working there, frankly. But, um, and you know, the, and, yeah, exactly. So, um, but you know, it's hard to get to the top. You have to really work hard. And sometimes you have to work harder than the men around you, quite frankly, and you have to be willing to do that. But it's about a matter of having, just having confidence in yourself, being persistent, um, and, and asking for those opportunities, not waiting for them to come to you. Because I had to ask for everything that I got, and it wasn't easy. Um, I think as women, what we need is we need flexibility more than we need the dollars. Um, as a working mom, I have twin boys that are 13 years old. I've worked since they were born, and um, I need flexibility in my job so I can take care of their needs as well as, um, as, well as the company. So, um, I think firms are more open to that now, that recognize there's more women in the workforce, women have different needs. Help us with that. Give us the time that we need so that we can be a good employee and a good parent as well. I think that's really, really important. Um, I think that, that's probably what I would say. I think that you know, there's a lot more um, inclusiveness in the workplace, and I'm happy to see that. I think diversity is extremely important. 
and I think women have a greater opportunity now than more than ever. When I started in the industry, I was the only woman at the board meetings, the only woman in the room in many circumstances, and I was always asked to take notes. I was the secretary. <laughs> That's changed. Now there's women that are you know, chairs of the board, and um, so I'm, I'm happy to see that happening. So don't give up, just keep up the good fight. Yeah, I think it's that, just that old notion of, you know, you pass down the family business to the oldest son, and that's just the tradition and how it's always been done. And, you know, in my circumstance, you know, it, it backfired because, you know, he passed away, and then my dad passed away. And, yeah, I was able to come in and step in, but had I been exposed to more areas, and it's not that they didn't think I could do it, I just didn't have to do it. Um, so, you know, being vocal, you know, with, with the matri patriarch or whoever he is and saying, yeah, I think I could do this. And I was telling Amy, with more automation and science today, this isn't the back breaking, you know, brow sweating industry that it used to be. You know, from your laptop, you can do a lot. You can see a lot. There's drones flying all over the place telling us how the crops are looking. You don't need to be in your pickup truck at 6 a.m. driving through the fields. Um, but as you choose your career path, and if it is ag, think about flexibility and hours and remote employment opportunities. Because like I said, I did quit. I went home and raised my kids. Um, we've got our social media marketing person lives up in Canada. She was just here this week visiting, but she can do her job from Canada. I think, so I think ag's an industry needs to be more flexible and realize if we really want to recruit and keep top talent, we need to create more flexible working environments, particularly for women. And quite frankly, you know, your partner in life and who you choose, when my dad died, my husband quit his job. And he went home, and I know Margaret's does too, and he was Mr. Mom. And he cooked and he cleaned and he drove the kids to the bus stop, and that's not for everybody. So if you're really serious and passionate about a career, you know, when you're choosing your partner in life, keep that in mind. <laughs> well, in terms of leadership, I. From my perspective, a recommendation would be know your staff and know it well. Not just because you read it in a book or because you saw it done. Because nobody will question you later on your decisions or when you have to make tough decisions or there are problems and people need to follow you. When you know your staff and you can prove it, people will respect you and they will follow you. So it's hard, it doesn't come easy. And also, nobody will give you a position of leadership if you haven't earned it and if you are not trusted by people. Okay. Um, there's, uh, as I understand, in terms of the uh, workforce, there's, a gro there's growing competition um, from technology and also from the emergence of the cannabis uh, industry. Um, being in Salinas Valley, we're not too far from Silicon Valley itself. So um, how do you compete for that workforce? So let's say, you know, we have a new generation of young people who are knowledge-based, increasing their skills. Um, how are you going after them? Or how will you? Well, again, I think um, mostly what Taylor Farms does is has an aggressive internship program so we can um, get a good look at the folks that are out there and see, um, see what they're all about. So I think that's kind of been um, our strategy. Bruce Taylor is very smart. He hires really good people and kind of lets them do their job. Um, so we have quite a bit of autonomy at work, which is, uh, which is nice for young people. A lot of millennials like to, you know, they know what they want. They know how they want to do it. Um, they might want to work different hours, but we're able to accommodate them for that. And like you said, remote um, job um, possibilities as well. So those are some of the things, I guess, just you know, having that flexibility, I think is really important. Um, you know, in my case, I was always kind of a jack of all trades. I was never a subject matter expert, but I wish I was. So I liked your comment earlier. Um, so, you know, we're looking for people that are confident, that know what they want to do, that aren't afraid to say, this job isn't working for me, can I try something different? Um, I like the company, but I'm not in the right slot. So um, I think confidence is something that we're really looking for and people that, that want to work hard and that want to um, help us grow our business and um, that are, you know, aggressive. You know, you've got you've to be able to sell yourself, and that's, that's the most important thing. As women, we have to speak up for ourselves. And I think now more than ever, women have a voice and women are being heard and people are listening. And so the timing is great for women. Um, I'd say it's not the year of the rat or the mouse or the whatever, it's the year of women. And I think women have a huge opportunity um, now more than ever, and so take advantage of it. 
Okay, we compete, we started marketing, well, the, the women-owned business was a huge recruitment tool. A lot of people wanted to come and work for a women-owned business, but really positioning us as a wellness company. You know, the products that we market are good for you, and the perimeter of the store is where the margin is made. So if you're a, selling Campbell's Soup, you don't want to be in those center store aisles anymore. Everyone wants to work for a perishable company because that's where the money's being made, that's where the action is. So. You know, I remember a lady, one of our best salespeople, she worked for Red Gold. It was a dice, a canned tomato company. But she said, it's so nice to sell a product I could be so proud of. You know, because we're selling wellness at the end of the day. We're selling these healthy products. We're not selling cheese whiz or whatnot. So positioning against more as a, a wellness company, a company that's selling wellness, not just a bag of broccoli, has helped us with the, the millennial appeal type of thing versus Silicon Valley. But, you know, we, I'm not going to lie, we have super commuters, I call them. You know, they drive over, you know, an hour and a half to, to get to work. And so it is difficult to compete with the South San Jose, um, even, you know, Southern Oakland, East Bay companies. But the category is growing. Um, you know, fresh cut vegetables grew 8.3% last year. So even if we sat back and did nothing, our sales were going to go up. Of course, we don't sit back and do nothing. Um, but it's nice to be you know, working in an industry that is so on trend. Uh, last year, I lost uh, my IT guy, which was doing a great job for us, and uh, to the cannabis industry. And then I lost another person to the cannabis industry. I cannot compete with the salaries that they're giving right now. I am hoping that eventually the hype sort of dies down and they are more realistic about uh, how much they're paying right now. Uh, so that puts us in a difficult position. We are trying now to build within, to build some of those skills within house. But we're also realistic that people may leave us after five years because we're giving them a lot of skills as well. So there may be other opportunities. So given that, we also have to plan structurally how do we have a business that we are, may have a rotation of personnel every five or six years and also how to create an environment, a working environment that is positive, where the culture is so good that people, even though they pay more somewhere else, they are comfortable where they are and they're comfortable where their community is so that uh, we don't incur those losses. But it is a challenge and I think uh, uh, we are gonna probably see those challenges as our industry also becomes more technology-oriented, technology even within our own industry, people will be switching shares when it comes to those areas. Okay. Um, I have a, one more question. I think we might open it up to the audience. There must be lots of questions out there. Um, so, you know, what do you love most about your job? I mean, you, you've all had so much experience in the industry and have stayed in it. Um, what has kept you in there despite the many, perhaps, ups and downs? Uh, for me, number one is the people. I think um, the people that I've met within our company, within the Valley, really across the world, um, people that are in agriculture are usually very down to earth. Um, like Lori said, they're doing it for the right reasons because they love the product. They like how they feel about selling the product and consuming the product. So um, I just think the people that I've come across in my career have been magnificent. Um, I've, I've really dealt with very few that I didn't like. So that's a really good sign, I would say. But um, I think it's just people in, in ag have deep roots. They care about their community. They care about their product. And they care about people. And I think that's what makes it really special. Yeah, I echo. It sounds like a cliche, but the, the people part this is a really, really difficult industry. It's highly regulated. You know, we all work for Mother Nature at the end of the day, so you wouldn't be in it if you didn't have a passion for it and, and what you do. So I think the favorite part of my job has just been the, the leadership role. You know, I love getting up. We, last week we had our year in review meeting with all the employees and playing the music. And, you know, of course we had good results, so that made the meeting a little bit easier. But um, <laughs> just being that, that leader and that champion and that voice of reason, being able to, you know, I, sometimes I had the mom role. I feel like I was mom to 934 people. Um, but just, you know, keeping them focused and, and driven and remind them of the successes. And yeah, sometimes you have to circle the wagons, but that just makes you stronger. 
Um, but I do want to mention, and I usually do, you know, don't be too hard on yourself. I think women in general, and you're going to go into this career and think that you just you need to be Wonder Woman, and you're not going to be able to. Um, I did, and I tell this story. I got home early from a business trip once, and I, I'm let, I go, I can pick my son Sam up from kindergarten. And my husband had dropped him off in the morning. So I'm standing there with all the other moms, and the kids are coming out, and they're Gap, and they're Gymboree, you know, just perfectly cute outfits. And Sam walks out, and he's got a T-shirt on and a bathing suit. And it, <laughs> it was clearly his floral, like, tropical bathing suit. So I'm like, hmm. And I, you know, I didn't want to make him feel nervous. So we get in the car, and we're driving home. I'm like, so Sam, you know, you're wearing, you wore a bathing suit to school. He goes, yeah, you know, Mom, I couldn't find any underwear this morning. And these shorts, they were built right in. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and I just had to laugh. I'm like, you know, you just can't take, be too hard on yourself. He lived. He's fine. He wore his bathing suit to school. <laughs> it was not the end of the world. So don't, don't be too hard on yourself. Um, I enjoy my job. Uh, one of the main reasons why I enjoy my job is I have a great boss. And he allows me to do the things I do. He allows me to fail from time to time and to have enough time to recover and go, well, that was a super thing to do. Uh, and he trusts me. He trusts my judgment and he trusts the judgment of the people that work for him and work for me. Also is this position in which I am and my team is, we're always learning. It's not stagnant. So if, uh, it's always changing year to year, and that's what makes it a little bit stressful. But it would be very different if I was doing the same thing year after year. So the fact that we are doing new stuff all the time, that uh, we you know, do trials and the trials fail, and sometimes we have evacuated our own building because the experiment went wrong. But that keeps you interested in your job. Also, um, and it makes you more open to new ideas. It makes you more humble as well. And also, it makes you look at the industry in a, in a different perspective of all the opportunities that are, are out there. And the fact that we deal mostly with food safety makes you feel that you are contributing, not just on making a machine run faster or efficiency, but you are taking care of the, your customer, that food safety is a priority, and we are getting more and more sophisticated, and we're getting more and more protection for our, our customer, our base. Okay, great. So we have some questions from the audience. Um, I'm gonna start with a couple here. Um, I think this is a, like a global question. Uh, so do you think other, countries do better in ag and how can we improve our ag by using um, the skills from folks in other from other countries well I certainly think there's great examples of agriculture around the world um, but I think you know we're pretty much pretty far advanced here I would say technolo technologically so I would I would think that we would be just as competitive as other countries um, if not ahead of the game I do know in in Mexico um, our operations that Taylor have down there are as sophisticated as they are in the Salinas Valley, if not even more so. Um, very impressive. The farming operations down there are phenomenal. So, you know, anyone who's worried about bringing produce out of Mexico um, because of the stereotype of it um, really needs to put that aside because the growers down there are meeting the same expectations that we have up here. So I think the, the playing field's fairly level. Well, I'm learning a lot more about this because we just sold to a global produce company. So I'm learning a lot about Nairobi and Turkey, and um, I think, you know, they've got the soil and the climate. A lot of times what they lack is the infrastructure. They don't have our freeway and our road system, so it's really hard for them to move the products that they grow, you know, around as, as effectively and efficiently as we do. Um, but, you know, over in Asia, they do a lot of the vertical indoor farming, more rooftop farms. They've got a lot of people to feed with a lot less land than we do. Um, and there's, you know, they've got more labor availability. So depending on the region, you know, Turkey is a lot of regions that are very similar to California and the Salinas Valley and Chile, but then it's the transportation piece that is a challenge for them. I think overall we're probably 10 years ahead of everyone from the technical side. 
Uh, but you see uh, differences even within uh, the US. Some places are, like California, pretty advanced, and then you find other places that are not. And I'm referring mostly to agricultural practices and processing. But um, I was surprised also that in terms of food safety and regulations and protections, uh, we're also ahead of many, many countries. So I said kudos for California because we've done a, a good job. And also, even though some people may not like it, but uh, regulations to a certain extent have helped us improve our game. So we have a an edge on a lot of countries out there that are our competitors. Now, uh, we need to be recognized for that uh, in terms of you know, uh, the value of, of our, our products as well when it comes to that. I don't think the consumer is fully aware of the difference, especially when it comes to food safety. Okay, here's a question about um, equal pay. Um, I actually think the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, you know, regularly comes out with obviously statistics and most recently, I, I mean, I know in New York State, it, and women are still earning about 89 cents per dollar, although New York and California are way ahead. So the question here is that, um, how are the wages for women um, starting out in um, agriculture and where do you think the industry is in terms of equal uh, pay? Well, this is my, my opinion only, but um, my experience has been, and I've actually had this conversation with several women recently, one of them is in the audience today, um, and I, my experience has been that women are definitely not paid the same as um, men, at least in the, in the two businesses that I've been, um, put my 35 years in. Um, again, going in and asking f um, for a raise from your boss is a very difficult conversation to have. And like um, Angela said, you better know your stuff um, because that's you know one of the things that you're going to be um, rated against. So I think it's I think it's a hard conversation. Um, I think as women we se we sometimes don't have it or we sell ourselves a little bit short. Um, like I said, it's not going to come to you. You're going to have to go in there and ask for it. And that's just my personal experience. I think that gap is is shrinking, but the the gap is still very much there, at least in the private industry um, in, in um, like privately held companies. I think it's probably there, but again, like with Margaret, it's it's just my hunch. Most of the ag businesses are family owned, they're privately owned businesses, so it is very extremely difficult to get salary survey data beyond, say, staff accountant. They're not gonna tell you what their regional sales managers are making or their director of marketing. It's very, very difficult, despite our trade associations trying to get, you know, what's your VPs, you know, what's your C-suite. So, um, I can tell you at one point I wanted to work at home two days a week and I was told, well, you're gonna have to take a pay cut if you wanna do that. And I was like, so I didn't think that was very fair. Um, but again, you've got the internet at your fingertips today. So I think we, the closest salary survey that we base ours on is food manufacturers in the Bay Area. That's like as close as we can kind of get in terms of, but there's salary.com, you know, do your homework, go in, know your worth and you get what you negotiate. I said that uh, it is, I believe it's shrinking, but also the, I believe that the more women enter this industry and they take a, move, a variety of jobs, there will be no option but to bring those salaries uh, uh, too much. But that means we have to get there. We have to get to those positions. We have to take those uh, uh, challenges. And we have to have the education behind us. So I think that's a challenge for women as well, that if you want a better salary, we need to take those positions, we need to take those challenges and move into the industry. How are your uh, respective companies uh, helping your employees sp grow professionally specifically? Well, um Actually, I think that that's a, that's a great question, and I think that there should be more um, professional leadership development within organizations. In my case, um, I came in with a lot of experience, so I was kind of given a, a credit card and a key and said, go to work and call me if you need any help. So, um, and, and in my six years, I haven't really had a lot of professional leadership development internally, and that's why I've sought it on the outside, because I think it's important as women that we um, continue to, to learn and to grow and um, develop personally and professionally, I think those are both really important. 
So um, seeking out those opportunities. Um, there's lots of great agricultural leadership programs within California and throughout the country, like a United Leadership Program, I was a participant in that. Um, so those, in, yeah, Western Growers of Industry has lots of those type of programs. So um, I encourage you to, you know, tell your boss that that's what you need and participate in those. It helps you um, get a lot more context too and broaden your, your networking base as well. Yeah, we encourage employees to enter the trade association leadership programs. We bring in guest speakers. Um, I'm in a group called Vistage. It's a CEO share group globally. So my Vistage speaker, we set up a, a group, mainly director level employees, and they meet offsite once a month with um, my Vistage leader, and they do a day in the life. Um, so everyone tells them about their jobs, a lot of team building exercises, how to break down communication silos. So. Um, that's about a $10,000 a month investment that we make with that group. We have a tuition reimbursement program. So if someone wants to do any continuing education at any accredited junior college college, if you pass the class, we um, cover your tuition. And we have a wellness program at work because, you know, health of your heart and your mind is just as important. So we have a gym. We have yoga, Pilates, a bar class. Um, we have our corporate chef comes in and does healthy cooking classes. She just depressed us all last week because she showed us a salad bar, what to pick and what not to pick. <laughs> We're like, darn it, no croutons, which we, we all knew, but anyway, kind of keeping it, keeping it fun. Um, we are a small company, so that becomes a little bit of a challenge, but uh, we try. Uh, what we are uh, now trying to do is to provide access to education through either night school or weekend school, but we're focusing on IT in technology, on programming. So we can be offering, you know, uh, I want to go and study arts or anything like that. In my, it, it has to be focused on the job. So if they are able to do that, if they find the time to do that, we provide them with uh, the resources and uh, the time. So, you know, if somebody's trying to finish a quick course on programming, maybe four days a week instead of five, we'll, we'll make the accommodation. But it also depends on the job, because a lot of our jobs, we travel. So that becomes a little bit difficult as well. Okay. I have another cannabis question um, here. Um, how will women in ag support and potentially be uh, allies for women in cannabis, uh, seeking recognition for cannabis as an ag crop and not just potentially a quote unquote ag product. I would love it to be like that because then I have more opportunities for my company <laughs> to go there and say, you need to do that safely. So I would okay. love that to be honest, but I think it has to be a communication between the industries need to start at some point because we have a lot in common. Uh, I mean, we grow we, with the same challenges, mm -hmm. the pest. Uh. I think, you know, I'm on the board of the Western Growers Association and we're grappling with that because they need insurance and, you know, regulatory help as well. I think the, the cash-based business is a huge hurdle because no one really knows how to handle the cash piece. But Lori Coster, personally, if it's if it's a legally operating business entity in the state of California, I'm all for you. Yeah, I don't I don't know enough about it. I know um, I know that it's definitely stealing some of our labor, and um, so I I try and just keep an open mind about it. And uh, like you said, it is a crop, and so um, I've always been kind of grateful that we could sell broccoli and lettuce and things like that, and not be like to tobacco or cannabis, but. Certainly there's huge opportunities there. It's growing. There's a lot of women that are involved in it, as the last panel mentioned. So I think we need to just keep an eye on it. And um, I don't think it's going away anytime soon. So like you said, just keep it legal. And um, then I think we'll all support it at some level. The biggest challenge is most of our operations are in refrigerated environments. It's cold. And cannabis isn't cold. So it's, it's a challenge. So, um, as with, uh, you know, what you talked about earlier, this can be a, a very busy and stressful industry. So, what do you do to keep yourself um, uh, sane or balanced? Oh, gosh. Well, exercise for sure. Um, I don't get enough sleep. I never sleep. That's probably part of my master's degree and my teenagers. But um, 
I, I think just, you know, I've done a much better job at balancing my, my life and, um, and my work and my kids and just keeping that all kind of, you know, in, um, get off the hamster wheel and just sort of slow things down a little bit and try to keep everything balanced. Harder to do than, um, than you know, to say it, but um, certainly a challenge. I think what keeps me up at night is, you know, just worrying about my kids' future, worrying about their education, and, um, you know, I'm sure they'll be just fine, but I don't, I don't really stay up wake thinking about work as much. I think I worry more about my kids and my, and my own health and getting through my master's than anything else. Well, that's one thing I suck at. I am terrible <laughs> at taking care of myself and putting myself first. Um, it played a big role in my personal decision to sell the business. Um, it's very, very stressful. Um, but, you know, I don't want to sit up here and feel sorry for myself, but it, it's hard. It, it's been a big challenge for me. So, really take that to heart when you decide your career path and, and what you want to do because it's sort of you get into this pattern and it's really hard to get out. So I'm getting better at it. My son's a senior, no offense, but he has a lacrosse game at five o'clock at PGI and I'm gonna go watch him play lacrosse. No offense. <laughs> I think we all suffer from the same ailment. Yeah. <laughs> I tried to exercise, I bought a treadmill, I bought a bicycle, I, I have a gym in my office. Yeah, I have a little uh, like puddle underneath my desk that I found out I needed to have a stable chair because I was moving up and down. So I try, but um, I go like three months without doing anything and then I get on the bicycle for a week. It's just very hard to, to do that, but one thing that I found it was essential for me was to get a good night's sleep. So um, I go to bed around 9.30. I try not to go beyond 10. And because I wake up very early too. In this industry, you cannot wake up at seven or eight. You need to be up early. So I try to do at least that. And it has paid off, I'm still here. So <laughs> must be working. <laughs> Okay, well, with that, we're gonna conclude the panel, the uh, Women in Agriculture panel. I wanna give a special round of applause again to our speakers, uh, Margaret Laurie and Angela. Thank them for coming and thank you for being such a good audience.